Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. This is the Q&A video for idea number 17, which was simply called Matter. Mostly we talked about the Pauli exclusion principle and the spin statistics theorem, so some combination of why two fermions cannot live in the same quantum state, and also why that's related to the spin of the fermions, the fact that they're spin one half or three half, etc. And I think that for today's Q&A will be pretty straightforward. I'm not going to try to load on a whole bunch of new heavy concepts. Let's just go through some questions and answer them. So to start, there's a very good one. Uh, what do you mean by matter anyway? I think, I forget exactly um, what I said, but the point of the video was to say that matter is the stuff out of which you're made, like the, the physical, tangible stuff. You, the table, the planet, stuff like that, right? So atoms, electrons, protons, and neutrons, okay? But clearly that's supposed to be, it sounds like some technical term that in this particular circumstance reduces to those particular things. But the point is actually, no, it's really not uh, a technical term in this sense at all. The philosophy behind this is that, you know, back in the day, as we said in previous, in the actual matter video, um, we had this image that maybe, you know, 120 years ago, we could have thought that the world was made of some combination of particles, like electrons, protons, and neutrons, even though they didn't know that those were the particles back then, held together by forces and pushed around by forces, okay? So there would be a separation into particles and forces. And uh, roughly speaking, particles were particle-like, obviously, and forces were wave-like. But then quantum mechanics came along and blurred that distinction a little bit, right? The whole origin of quantum mechanics was people discovering first that waves had particle-like properties, that when you observe photons, when you observe light sufficiently carefully, it comes in packets of energy, which we now call photons. And then of course, particles have wave-like properties. That's why electrons are not orbiting in little solar system-like pictures in an atom. They're spread out over the wave function. And so another leap forward of unification came with quantum field theory. And now we say that everything is made of fields. So the point is that this old fashioned dichotomy between matter and forces isn't there anymore. It's just not an exact part of nature. So when we say matter, we're not actually hiding some technical term that we're not giving you the definition for. We're using it in an informal way. Uh, the dif distinction between fermions and bosons, particles that take up space versus particles that like to climb on top of each other, is scientifically accurate and rigorous, and we told you what that was. It's the wave function is symmetric or anti-symmetric. But we just use matter in a very colloquial way. And I get why that can be confusing. So one little sub-question here is mass in, um, in, the in the following sense. Sometimes in very colloquial speech, not among professional physicists, but just out there on the street, it's almost like matter and mass are synonyms. You know, you talk about the amount of matter you have, right? And you can weigh it, okay? Uh, and again, this is something where you have the old fashioned terminology and it gets adapted with slight changes into the rigorous scientific vocabulary. So mass is something perfectly well defined. Mass is, you can, you can define it in the following way. Take an object, what is its mass? Well, put the object at rest, and ask how much energy it has, then E equals MC squared. So if you like, mass is the energy of an object at rest divided by C squared, okay? That's not the only way to define it. In the Newtonian limit, you have F equals MA. So if you know you're exerting a force on something, then you can measure its acceleration. That's what the mass is, the inertial mass of something. But in this distinction between fermions and bosons, there's no mapping on to that particular idea that mass is related to either fermions or bosons, but not both. There are certainly massless bosons, right? There are long range forces, the photon of electromagnetism, the graviton of gravity, but there are also massive bosons. There's no problem with a boson having mass, even though in our informal classification, we didn't qualify it as matter, okay? The W and Z bosons, the Higgs bosons, etc. Likewise, fermions, we called matter, and all the fermions that we know about in the world are massive. They have at least a little bit of mass, but the neutrinos have very, very low masses, and it was believed for a long time, at least believed to be plausible, that neutrinos were exactly massless. There is no problem in principle with having exactly massless 
fermions either. We just don't seem to have those in the standard model. So there's no direct relationship between the idea of mass and the idea of matter. That was just, you know, speaking informally, if anyone ever confused those two things. The other uh, confusion that comes up is well, what about dark matter, right? You've heard about dark matter. We'll talk about it later in another video when we talk about cosmology. Very, very good reasons to believe that dark matter is real. And I just did a video on matter, which was really about fermions and the Pauli exclusion principle and the spin statistics theorem. Does that imply that dark matter should be made of fermions? And the answer is no. This is just, again, an unfortunate sloppiness of nomenclature, okay? Dark matter, so matter does have a meaning to cosmologists, uh, but the meaning is different. You know, astronomers, this, this very, happens very often. Astronomers have a meaning to the word metal, right? M-E-T-A-L. What's a metal? You know, you might have a chemistry in mind and you might think that there's some heavy elements that are metallic and some that are not. To astronomers, usually metals are anything heavier than helium. Uh, sometimes anything heavier than hydrogen. It depends on what you mean. But basically most of the atoms in the world are hydrogen and helium. So astronomers just say everything heavier than that is just a metal, even though, you know, neon or something like that or carbon, uh, not a very good metal. Um, so we adapt the words to different circumstances that give us information uh, in the context that we're using them. So to a cosmologist, cosmologists care about what is making up the stuff of the universe. And so cosmologists say that matter is anything that is moving velocity much less than the speed of light. That's what it means. Particles with velocities much less than the speed of light. And the contrast is not with forces, but with radiation. Radiation is another thing that is very important to the universe. Let's not make this an equal sign. Let's make it narrow. The velocities equal the speed of light. So radiation is anything, and when I say the velocity is equal to the speed of light, let's make that almost equal, okay? So as long as something is moving at a substantial fraction of the speed of light, it counts as radiation, and if it's moving slowly, it counts as matter. Why is that? Because that affects the cosmological evolution. Um, if you think about the expansion of the universe, let's draw it this way. So here's the universe, space, and it's expanding over time, right? It gets bigger, and there's some particles and some radiation in there, okay? So there's some number of particles, and there's also some photons of radiation. Maybe this is going this way, this one's going that way. And what happens is everything dilutes as the universe gets bigger. So the, let's, let's say for a little thought experiment here, for a situation that we're looking at, that particles and radiation are not being created or destroyed, okay? So neither matter particles nor photons or anything are being produced or annihilated. They're staying the same number as space expands. Then the number of particles stays the same and the density of particles goes down because space gets bigger. So for matter to cosmologists, the total energy, let's call it the energy density. The energy density is usually written rho, and that is the number density times the energy per particle, okay? So this is particles per volume the number of particles per cubic megaparsec or whatever. And this is the energy per particle. And if the particle is moving slower than the speed of light, we're, seeing, we're thinking much slower. Like it'd be really weird if particles were moving at exactly 0.5 the speed of light. There's a whole bunch of room for the particles to be moving very, very close, 99.9% .9 of the speed of light, and a whole bunch of room for their, them to be moving at 0 0.001 the speed of light. But it'd be weird if they had the same order of magnitude. So we call those warm matter particles, but we don't really pay much attention to them. They're, it's unlikely that we'd hit that sweet spot exactly. But the energy is mass times the speed of light squared, right? So this is just the number density of particles times the mass times the speed of light squared. And what happens is the mass and the speed of light just stay the same. So as space expands, um, we talk about the scale factor. And let's call it A. 
don't ask me why it's called A. You might say, well, should we call it R for distance or something like that? But there's so many R's all there already in general relativity with the Riemann tensor and the Ricci tensor and everything. It's easier just to call the scale factor A. So it's going up, right? So this energy density, as A goes up, the energy density goes down because space gets bigger, the number of particles stays the same. And this is proportional. Oops, what happened there? Oh my goodness, go away. Yeah, this is proportional to a to the minus three, because the linear size is A, the volume is A cubed, the density goes down as the volume goes up, okay? And that's what is important for cosmology. So let me shrink this a little bit. What's important for cosmology is how the energy density changes as a function of the scale factor, because that's gonna go into helping you understand how fast the universe is expanding and how that expansion rate is changing over time. Whereas for radiation, the energy density, oops, rho, is again, it's still the number density times the energy per particle. And the number density goes, uh, let's just call it n still, but E, what is the energy per particle? Well, um, you have these photons, but they're being redshifted, right? Their wavelengths are being stretched with the expansion of the universe, okay? So the energy of the particle, E radiation, uh, equals h, Planck's constant, times the frequency. And the frequency goes down as the wavelength goes up, right? As you stretch the wavelength, it vibrates less and less frequency, frequently as it passes you by. So this is proportional to one over the scale factor, okay? So n times e is n times h times the frequency, and that is proportional to, well, n, the number density, goes down like a cubed, and f, the frequency, goes down like a, so this is proportional to 1 over a to the fourth. As opposed to this, let's just put it in similar notation here, 1 over a cubed. So this is what cosmologists care about. Cosmologists care about not whether something is solid, because you know none of these dark matter particles are making up chairs and tables, or even planets, probably. Uh, they're just particles out there all by themselves. What cosmologists care about are the particles moving close to the speed of light? Because if they're moving close to the speed of light, their energy density fades away faster as space expands. So matter goes as a to the minus three, radiation goes as a to the minus four. So what does this have to do with bosons and fermions? Nothing at all, absolutely zero. So cosmologists talk about dark matter. They do not mean even a little bit that the dark matter is supposed to be fermions because they don't mean matter in the sense of solid matter that you can put a coffee cup on, okay? They just don't care about that. So if you look at the list of dark matter candidates, you have the weakly interacting massive particles, right? Those are typically fermions. It just works out that way. Again, there's no special benefit bosons or fermions, but it works out that in supersymmetric models, the easiest candidates for stable dark matter particles are fermions. But the second most common candidate, uh, popular candidate, let's say, for dark matter are the axions, and the axions are bosons. They're little scalar bosons. Uh, so there's no connection between the cosmologist's use of the word matter and whether something is a boson or fermion, long story short. What matters is they're not moving close to the speed of light. I should mention here, I said, you know, photons redshift, okay, uh, and that makes sense because you think of the photon as really a wave, no matter how much I tell you it, it, it looks like a particle. Um, but the same relationship between the scale factor and the energy of a particle is true for any particle that moves close to the speed of light. So even if you're not literally a photon, you would still lose momentum as the universe expands if you're moving close to the speed of light. Once you're much slower than the speed of light, then who cares? Your energy is coming from mc squared, not from your velocity, okay? But the velocity changes if you move close to the speed of light in an important way. So this radiation does not simply mean electromagnetic radiation. It would be just as true for gravitational radiation, even though the energy density that is expected to be very low. It would be also true if you had some other kind of particles, like if neutrinos really were massless, then they would act like radiation. They're not, they're massive. So once, you know, so the neutrinos have a regime in which they do move close to the speed of light. Uh, roughly speaking, if the, well, the velocities are high enough, they move close to the speed of light and then they would redshift away like radiation. And that's very important. Cosmologists take that into consideration. 
if the universe expands so much that the neutrinos start moving slowly compared to the speed of light, then suddenly they act like matter. And that depends on what the masses of the neutrinos are. Okay, more cosmology than you really need to know there, but again, different uses of the word matter in different contexts. Okay, here's a harder question. Um, the Pauli exclusion principle versus E and M. And what I mean here is uh, for stability of matter. When you make a table uh, or a chair or whatever, when you push those atoms close together, is the reason why the atoms do take up space, is it really ultimately because of the Pauli exclusion principle? Or is it because of the electromagnetic repulsion of the particles, of the electrons and the protons and so forth? Um, the answer is, uh, it really is mostly because of the Pauli exclusion principle, but it's complicated. And you can tell it's going to be complicated. If you think of you know two atoms and you try to put them on top of each other, Strictly speaking, what the Pauli exclusion principle says is you can't put the electrons of those atoms into exactly the same quantum state. It doesn't, strictly speaking, say you can't put them really, really close to each other in the quantum state, right? But it turns out you can't. I mean, it turns out that there is some force, effectively, pushing particles away from quantum states that other fermions are already in. And that's Fermi worked out uh, this whole story, but, you know, not very convincingly because it's complicated. So people have continued to think about it. Uh, if you want to look up a, a fairly modern work on this, Elliot Lieb is a guy... Uh, Shouldn't write and talk. Elliot Lieb has written some papers on the stability of matter and explaining it's really because of the Pauli exclusion principle, mostly. And you can sort of, I mean, that does make sense, right? Certainly, the sizes of atoms are set by the Pauli exclusion principle, right? The, you're trying to put electrons into energy levels. You can't all squeeze them down, so they have to have a big, more extended uh, energy level. So they're bigger when you have more electrons in there. Um, if it turns out if electrons were bosons, then matter would not, just not be stable. All the atoms would just pile right on top of each other. Electromagnetism, however, does play an important role in the precise way in which atoms and molecules come together. So it's not just the Pauli exclusion principle until you get down to like a neutron star or white dwarf densities. For ordinary tables and chairs, electromagnetism matters a lot, but still the Pauli exclusion principle matters even more for, for figuring out the size and the stability of matter. So I have to sort of say, trust me on that one or read these papers. Those are your two choices. I can't really give you a uh, convincing casual explanation of that. Okay, here's a, here's a good question, which you know, I probably should have uh, answered long ago. You know, spin, we talk about the spin of, let's say, an electron, it's spin up or spin down because it's a spin one half particle. The two possible measurement outcomes you get are separated by h bar, so that's separated by one, so you either get plus or minus one half. Um, why is it, though, <laughs> that when you actually put the electron through, let's say, the stern gerlach experiment, okay, here's our very simplified stern gerlach experiment. Here's an electron goes through a magnetic field, and it either goes up or down, spin up or spin down. And the point of this was it's never in between, okay? No matter what the original spin of the electron was. You might imagine that if the spin of the electron was perpendicular to the magnetic field, then it would go right on through, right? It would not be going up or down at all. Why is it? that it goes discreetly into those two possibilities of either spin up or spin down. Someone, someone said very, very, uh, I forget who, who, who put it into the questions, but this is a very perceptive comment. Um, when we talk about electrons in atoms and the fact that they have discrete energy levels, or when we talk about particles in quantum field theory, uh, in both cases, we start with something which is very, very wavy, and the discreteness only comes about because of boundary conditions when we solve the equations that these waves are satisfying. So here we have some discreteness, spin up or spin down. Where does that come from? That doesn't sound like something that starts off as wavy. Uh, it is, a, it, and that's true. It's a slightly different explanation here. Um, let's imagine that you did have spin right. So let's say the spin, we're gonna write down the spin wave function of the electron, okay? Uh, let's imagine that it's pointing in the x direction. So we're imagining little uh, axes here, x, y, z, and the magnetic field 
is pointing in the z direction, okay? So let's imagine we've set up the electron to be spinning in the x direction, so perpendicular to the magnetic field. What's going to happen? Well, if you go all the way back to our discussion of the uncertainty principle, etc., we talked about the fact that an electron with a spin in the x direction can be written. It's not changing anything. It's exactly the same thing. As 1 over the square root of 2, an electron pointing in the plus z direction, plus an electron pointing in the minus z direction. In other words, spin right, if this is the axis pointing right, is a superposition, can be thought of as a superposition of spin up and spin down. This is part of the spin version of the um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So this is, these, this is truly an equality. This is just two different ways of writing down exactly the same thing. So, and this is not, this would not be, there's no classical analog of this, okay? This is true quantum mechanics coming at you here. So, when you say you have a particle whose spin is perpendicular to the uh, magnetic field it's going to pass through, that is the same as saying you have a superposition of a particle that's spin plus along the magnetic field and a particle spin minus along the magnetic field, okay? And then it turns out that in order to ask what you actually observe, you have to go through the Schrodinger equation. You have to go say, what's the Hamiltonian? How does this magnetic field interact with the spin that is passing through it? And the answer is, in this case, with the magnetic field pointing in the z direction, the magnetic field interacts with these two components separately in completely independent ways. It does not interact directly with what you would call the x direction of the spin. It feels and acts on these two parts of the spin wave function, the plus z part and the minus z part. It sends the plus z part up like this. It sends the minus z part down like that. If you rotated the magnetic field, so the magnetic field are pointing in the x direction, then it would interact with this x part of the magnetic field. It would interact with the x uh, way of saying, way of writing down what the magnetic field, what the electron's spin field was. So it's not a spin field, the electron's spin was. So that's the best I can do to explain why you get these two discrete things. It's because from the point of view of the magnetic field, which is pointing in the z direction and interacting with the electron in a very specific way, the right way to think about the electron is as a superposition of spin up and spin down. That's what it is. It's not spin left, spin right, spin in different directions. The interaction with the magnetic field sets the right way to write down what the electron spin is actually doing, and that's why it goes into spin up and spin down. <laughs> so I started writing the question, why discrete spin observations? Why are discrete spins observed? That's why. Hopefully that's successful uh, as an explanation. Related question, um, how many spins can be observed? Spin states, spin answers. How many answers can you get to the question, what is the spin of this particle? Uh, well, for spin one half, Indeed, as we just said, you can get two. You can get up and down. But then what about spin one? So let's say you sent um, a photon or a W boson through this kind of experiment. What would it do? So it turns out that once you go beyond spin one half, the right thing to say is for any particle of any spin, the number of possible spin states that you can observe, uh, let's just erase it. The number of possible spin states you can observe, the answer is 2 times the spin plus 1. Okay, so if it's a spin 1 half particle, uh, 2 times a half is 1, plus 1 is 2. If it's a spin 1 particle, 2 times 1 is 2, plus 1 is 3. If it's a spin 3 halves particle, it would be 4. Spin 2 particle, 5, etc. Okay. So if you had a W boson, for example, which has spin 1, and you send it through the stern gerlach experiment, you had to do it very, very quickly, because W bosons decay very rapidly, but in principle, you would get three different possible answers. Spin up, plus 1, spin down, minus 1, and spin 0. There's a spin 0 component of the W boson. It ate the Higgs boson, remember? It got a spin 0 component that way. Um, except that if a particle is massless, then it's always moving at the speed of light. 
And then particles that move at the speed of light, there's only two ways for the spin to be. The spin can either be lined along the direction of motion or against the direction of motion. Notice that this only makes sense for particles that are moving at the speed of light. If a particle is moving slower than the speed of light, you can always go into its rest frame where it's not moving at all, or you can just go into a frame where it's moving in the opposite direction. But if a particle is moving at the speed of light in some direction, then everyone agrees that particle is moving at the speed of light in that direction. And in that case, there's only spin along the direction of motion or spin against the direction of motion. So for massless particles, they have what is called helicity. And the helicity is just the amount of spin in the direction of the uh, particle motion. And there's only two values, plus or minus. But they'd be separated by a bigger number if the spin of the original particle were bigger. So remember, for a spin two particle, for example, which has five fundamental, in principle, spin components, they would be um, spin two particle is plus two, plus one, zero, minus one, minus two. So if it's a massless spin two particle, the graviton, it's plus two along the direction of motion or minus two along the direction of motion. But in principle, otherwise, if you somehow had a weird theory with a massive spin two particle, there would be five possible spin states you would get and they would all be discrete and they all would be observable in a stern gerlach experiment. There's one other caveat here, the actual Stern Gerlach experiment, Stern Gerlach experiment, it's making use of the fact that the electron is electrically charged. So it's both spinning and it's electrically charged. It's like a little magnet. It's like the Earth with this magnetic field. And so it can be spinning up or spinning down. And it's that magnetic field of the electron that is actually coupling to this magnetic field that it's passing through. So in principle, you could have a neutral spinning particle that just wouldn't be deflected by the magnetic field at all. In practice, you know there are things called Feynman diagrams and virtual particles. So in practice, even neutral particles have this cloud of virtual particles around them which have some electrically charged particles in them so they can still have what is called a magnetic moment and they might still be able to be deflected in a stern gerlach experiment, but it'd be a very, very, very tiny amount of deflection. Okay, uh, good. There's another question. It's not, you know, as usual, it's not exactly the question that's asked. I, I interpret it in my own way. Um, why are gauge bosons spin one and the graviton spin two? I'm not going to answer this question <laughs> very, very effectively, but I'll chat about it just a little bit. Um, Someone, I think the literal question that someone asked was, is it just a coincidence that photons and W bosons are both spin one? Um, no, it's not a coincidence. And gluons are also spin one. Gauge bosons are spin one. And here's the hand wavy way that I will uh, talk about it. Remember that these gauge bosons, the field from which they come is the connection field okay, for some gauge symmetry. You thought you were past that, didn't you? You thought you wouldn't need to think about this anymore, but this is exactly what it is. The connection is the way that if I have some path between two points and I have a vector, uh, the connection tells me how to parallel transport that vector along the path, right? Remember that? If my vector is for an internal symmetry, right, like red, green, blue, okay, then the connection looks like A mu A B, where if I write, let's see if I can write this correctly. So this is a vector V A one and V A two. So the components of this vector get the letter A and the letter A in this case is an index that runs over, let's say red, green, or blue. If it's a quark, right? It's in color space. This is a vector in color space. It's not a vector in real space that has an index x, y, z. It's a vector in color space that has it. So we give it a different uh, alphabet, the Roman alphabet, or we use different letters. Let's put it that way. We we're only trying to use the Roman alphabet here. But uh, A, instead of I, J, K, which we might use for x, y, and z, we use letters like A, B, and C for color space indices, okay? So red, green, and blue, 
the different quark colors, do not have any relationship with directions in space, okay? With directions in physical space, up, down, left, right, forward, backward. So mu here is a space-time index. And it's telling you how you're moving in space-time along this path, right? That's what it's there for. Whereas these indices are internal indices, color indices in the case of quark fields, okay? So this is the kind of field you need to have a gauge symmetry in an internal space. And the point is that there is one space-time index. And the fact that there's one space-time index means that as far as space-time is concerned, this is a vector, okay? And vectors are things that when you rotate them around by 360 degrees, they come back to where you started. That's why vectors are spin one. So this would be a spin one particle. And that's why gauge bosons are spin one. It's a very hand-wavy explanation, but it, the essential truth is actually there, okay? Whereas, remember that gravity can be thought of as a gauge theory, but it's a weird gauge theory. It's not, it doesn't work the same way that the other gauge theories do. Uh, and one of the reasons why it's weird is because you don't have any internal degrees of freedom for gravity. Everything is just space-time, okay? It's space-time that is uh, the direction in which you move and the direction in which a vector that you parallel transport in would be, okay? And that further has, there's an extra complication that in fact you derive the connection from the metric in gravity. You don't start with the connection, usually most typical in the way that Einstein would have done it, let's put it that way, you derive the connection from the metric. And the metric, remember, is a tensor, which looks like a little matrix in space-time, G mu nu, so that's a four by four matrix, and again, there are two indices now that run over time and space, T, X, Y, Z, the four dimensions of space-time. And you usually, as we said very briefly last time, you write this as uh, the Minkowski metric, eta mu nu, plus a little perturbation, and we call that H mu nu. So H mu nu is the field whose tiny fluctuations give rise to the graviton. And guess what? It has two indices not just one. It has two space-time indices. So you're going to take my word for it, but that means it becomes spin two. To get the actual answer there, you have to talk about things like we talked about before, you know, how do particles respond to the fluctuations in this metric tensor passing by, gravitational waves, rotation by 90 degrees, all that stuff, the different polarizations of the gravitational waves. Um, but there are, but none of this is a coincidence or an accident is the real point here. There are reasons why the different gauge bosons have the different spins that they do. This is sort of a half-baked way of explaining what those reasons are, but nevertheless, the reasons are there. That's the more important thing. A um, couple more little questions. This one was kind of fun, so I, you know, I liked it. I had to think about it, actually, myself. Um, we talked about the fact that when you interchange two particles, uh, when you interchange the wave function x1, x2, we said that either you got plus psi x1, x2, in other words, it stayed the same, or you got minus psi x1, x2, and we called these bosons, and we called these fermions. And the argument was that, well, if you interchange and then interchange again, you better get back to where you started, right? So if you multiply by some other number other than plus one or minus one, that wouldn't happen. So these are the two options. So some clever person said, well, why not uh, psi goes to the complex conjugate of psi? That is another operation which when you do it twice, when you complex conjugate twice, you go back, complex conjugate twice, you go back to where you started. Uh, the reason why this doesn't work is because, that, well, the technical reason, the highbrow reason is complex conjugation is a transformation that is not smoothly connected to the identity. It is a discrete transformation once and for all. It's like a reflection in complex space. So if you think about complex plane, here's the real part of psi, and here's the imaginary part of psi. Complex conjugation takes a point here and just moves it all the way down 
to a point right down there, okay? It flips across the axis. Every, every point over here is brought down to its reflection point on the other side of the real axis. And so it is absolutely true that if you do this twice, you get back to where you started. But what's also true is that you can't do it just a little bit, right? When we talked about this interchange operation, um, sure, what we care about is the answer when you get all the way over to having interchanged both of them, but it needs for it really to be an interchange of the two particles, something has to happen along the way. There is a wave function corresponding to having moved the particles a little bit, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more. What we're telling you is what the wave function is once you get to exactly uh, the two particles interchanged, but something has to happen to it along the way. That's why what matters is that there needs to be a way to smoothly connect that transformation to the identity. It can't be a simple on or off kind of thing. So there would be some other transformation of psi in the real world case for bosons or fermions when you move the particles just a little bit. And it's generally complicated, and I'm not going to write it down, but what we know is that when you move them all the way, it either picks up a plus one or a minus one. Okay, final question, um, which I think, you know, I said something about this in the lecture, in the video, but uh, maybe I can be more clear. Um, how, again, I'm, I'm saying this in my own language, how do white dwarfs, become neutron stars or neutron stars become black holes. Both the things which we think happen and create giant explosions when they do happen. Um, the point being that, in, that white dwarfs and neutron stars um, really are degenerate stars. By degenerate, in this case, we don't mean they're perverted. We mean that they have uh, all of the electrons or all the particles that make them up are packed as closely as they can possibly be. The thing keeping a white dwarf from collapsing or a neutron star from collapsing is absolutely the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay, You just can't squeeze the fermions more densely than that. And so the reason why white dwarfs, white dwarfs are bigger than neutron stars, and that's because they're made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons, neutrons, electrons. Neutron stars are just made of neutrons, okay? And for the white dwarfs, protons and neutrons don't really matter because remember, electrons have a longer Compton wavelength because their mass is lower. And therefore, when you pack them close together, they take up more space. So any one electron has a bigger volume than a proton or a neutron does at its degeneracy pressure limit, at when it's packed as closely as it can possibly be. So who cares about the protons and neutrons for white dwarfs? I mean, they're there, and they, they give you the mass of the white dwarf. But the density is fixed by the electrons, whereas the density of the neutron star is fixed by neutrons. So it's way more dense because neutrons are much smaller and their Compton wavelengths are much smaller, so you can fit them closer to each other. So the question was, I think that the, the, the spirit of the question was, well, if you start with a white dwarf, um, how can you ever pack it closely enough to make it into a neutron star? Like the electrons, like you just said, the electrons are packed as closely as they possibly can be. Or likewise, uh, maybe a clearer way of asking the question is for a neutron star, since neutrons are uh, heavier and they, there's nowhere for them to go, how can they ever even collapse into a black hole? Um, so for the white dwarfs collapsing to neutron stars, you know, this was uh, the, the work that made Chandrasekhar famous, uh, the Chandrasekhar limit. Uh, it, and it's, it's, it involves complicated physics because it's not just general relativity. It's also the nuclear and particle physics that's going on. And what happens is because of quantum mechanics, when you have all these electrons tightly packed, but there are also electron, uh, protons and neutrons there, there is a probability just like there's a probability when you have a neutron all by itself, there's a probability it will decay into a proton, an electron, and a neutrino. When you have a proton, a neutron, and an electron, there's a probability that the proton and the electron come together to make a neutron and, an, and a neutrino. So, so neutron decay looks like this. Neutron goes to proton plus electron plus antineutrino. But um, 
what what to call this? Uh, I don't know what to call it, but you know, neutron star creation starts from proton plus electron goes to neutron plus. What do you think it has to be? This is a little homework assignment for you. I mean, you know electric charge has to be conserved, but the electric charge on the left, proton plus electron, is zero. So you need a neutral particle. And you know that baryon number has to be conserved. So there's baryon number one on the left, already baryon number one on the right. So you need baryon number zero. And lepton number is conserved. You have lepton number one on the left, so you need a lepton on the right. And in fact, the electron is going to be, uh, electronness is going to be approximately conserved here. So it's the, not the anti-neutrino, but the electron neutrino that is uh, created. And this is why when you get a supernova explosion, when a white dwarf collapses to make a neutron star, uh, it's a prime target for detecting neutrinos in the universe, right? Supernova 1987A uh, was detected in neutrinos. There's like 13 neutrinos that were detected here uh, many light years away from the actual supernova because it gives off all these neut neutrinos. So this is an unlikely event, right? This is slow, this is not probable, but if you have a whole star full, occasionally it will happen. And when it happens, it likes to stay that way because it's smaller. The whole thing wants to get smaller. And so it's that there, what Chandrasekhar showed is there is a point of no return, a point where it is so dense that this starts happening rapidly. And then you get this supernova explosion. For the neutron stars going to black holes, it's a trickier situation. Uh, it's more a pure general relativity statement. Um, it's, it's, the neut neutrons really have nowhere to go, okay? I mean, there's not, I, I can't say that. Um, maybe they have somewhere to go, um, but there's very little room because you can prove just on the basis of general relativity that if whatever matter you have that makes up your star is relatively normal, like as a positive energy, positive pressure, things like that, the pressure is not greater than the energy density, there's a whole bunch of things you can put on without going into the details of the nuclear physics, you can show that if you make things dense enough, they have to keep collapsing. It's just gravity always wins in that case. So what has to happen somehow is that the quantum wave function of the stuff that is making up the neutrons converts into something else, which is not violating the Pauli exclusion principle. So the question being asked was, is are the rules of quantum mechanics somehow being violated? Uh, the answer is no. The rules of quantum mechanics are not being violated. The Pauli exclusion principle is not put on hold temporarily or anything like that. Uh, but we can get this conclusion that neutron stars will collapse if they become sufficiently dense purely from general relativity. And quantum mechanics is going to have to adapt. Quantum mechanics is going to have to allow the wave function for the neutrons to turn into something that can have energy packed into a smaller region. And the details of how that happens are not clear. They're certainly not clear to me. There are people who study them and know a lot more than I do. If you've ever heard of the concept of strange stars or charmed stars, it comes from the idea that possibly uh, you could trade in, you know, a neutron is uh, an up quark and two downs. So you could create a strange baryon with up, down, and a strange quark. Remember, a strange quark is heavier than the ups or the downs. So this particle in real the real world would just decay away very, very quickly. But... Uh, if it's packed densely enough, it's more massive than the neutron is. So maybe you could convert over to particles with strange quarks in them. In fact, maybe you could convert all of the up and down quarks into strange quarks, and then you could squeeze them more tightly. Um, I don't know what the state of the art is about whether these things actually exist. Remember, there's the, there's the size of a real neutron star, and there's a, a proof that you can do in general relativity that nothing can be this dense or more. And there's a little bit of room in between the actual density of neutron stars and the maximum limit you get from general relativity. So there might be room for stars that are more compact than neutron stars, but still made of quarks and not forming black holes. That's something that, uh, again, we don't, I don't think we know about it. There are people, I th I'm not sure how it depends on what your feelings are about the laws of physics. Like in the standard model of particle physics, maybe people know, or maybe people are pretty confident, um, but maybe there are slight variations 
in the standard model of particle physics. So people talk about quark stars and things like that. Uh, as far as I know, that's still an open question. Um, that's a good place to end the Q&A video because you need to be reminded occasionally there's plenty of questions I don't know the answer to. That's one of them. I'm sure you'll continue to find more and more.